willing to do that? To give up it all, to lay down what is necessary in your life, to make your very life for God. Let's pray. Father, you have given us so much. And you continually give us so much. Not only just through Jesus Christ, but on a daily basis. You deserve our love. You deserve our obedience. The Lord often times that's hard. Father, as we approach your word today, as we look at what you have for us, I just pray that you open our hearts and minds. Our very souls, Lord, hear what you have us here to learn what you have us learned. Father, speak to us. In Christ's name. Amen. You know, a rite of passage here in the United States, here in other places, is the ability to drive a car. People, oftentimes, you hit 16, you get your driver's license in, you're ready to drive. That freedom, right? Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, don't have the money for a car. They, they have to, like kids oftentimes have to ask their parents to borrow the car. There's a story of a boy who's 16, he has a driver's license, he wants to borrow the family's car. And so he goes to his dad and says, Dad, can I borrow the car? Now, his dad was a pretty conservative, fairly strict kind of guy. He had conditions. He said, you can borrow my car, son, on three conditions. First, you've got to get your grades up. You've got to prove to me that you can study, that you're taking, being responsible in that area before I can let you drive a car. Second, we're a Christian family and, and you need to be reading the Bible. I want to see you read the Bible every day before you can drive a car. And third, he looked at his son like this. I want you to cut your hair. Hair is too long. You gotta make sure that you get it cut, nice, decent cut. Then I'll let you drive my car. Well, the son thought the first two were pretty easy, the third one was pretty tough. He liked his, his hair, you know. He was cool. So, so a few weeks passed and he came one day, he came back to his dad, and he said, Dad, I really want to borrow the car. He said, all right. He says, look at my grades. He puts his grades out there. He got all A's and B's. He says, well, you're a third there. He says, and, and Dad, I've been reading the Bible every day. He says, well, good. Good, you're two-thirds there. But I, I noticed that your hair is still a little bit long. He says, well, God, uh, you know, I was going to talk to you about that, Dad. He says, you know, Jesus, Jesus had long hair, and he didn't cut his. Dad looked at him and said, that's, that's right. And Jesus walked everywhere he went. <laughs> Now, now, you may agree or disagree with the dad's points, etc. It doesn't really matter. The point is, his dad had sat down, oh, this is what you need to do. And the son was willing to go part way, but he wasn't willing to go all the way. What God asks for us is not a part way thing. He doesn't ask for us to just do what feels comfortable for us or what we think we can achieve. God is asking for a complete faith, a complete obedience, following His plan, following His design for our lives 100%, not 33% or 75%. 75%. 
question is, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to exercise unwavering obedience? Because the thing is, unwavering obedience, it can be difficult. It can be, it can be costly. It can be hard. Luke 4 1 is our memory verse. It's talking about Jesus here. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, this is where he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice those words. He's full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had come down upon him like a dove. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He left the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit. The Spirit is guiding him. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And if you know the story, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights he fasts. And at that time, Satan decides to tempt him. Now, 40 days, 40 nights of fasting, he's hungry, right? And the first thing, the first temptation that Satan throws at him is about bread. He says, you're hungry. You're hungry. And he tempts him. He says, well, you know, you can pop these stones and turn into bread. And Jesus says, well, you know, the man doesn't live by bread alone. He comes back to Scripture. But he, he counters it. He keeps tries to get Jesus at his weakest point. Jesus is obeying his Father. He's been led by the Spirit. And Satan is attacking him in this moment. The, the second two are similar. I mean, he's like, um, you know, takes him to the highest point of the temple, and he says, you know, you know, if you throw yourself down, command your angels, you know, the angels will come and lift you up. And, and Jesus counters this with Scripture. And then he takes him to the highest mountain. He says, look over all these kingdoms. You can just worship me, serve me, and so I'll be yours. What is it? Yeah, I mean, Satan is attacking him in a physical sense, in a safety sense, in a power sense. He's attacking him in all the different ways that we are tempted as well when we try to obey God. When we try to obey God, and, and try to follow him, Satan is going to buffet us in, in, in the, our physical sense, our safety sense, our sense of who we are, and, and our status, etc. He's always going to try to attack us, but as we see in the example of Jesus, Jesus, led by the Spirit, is following his Father completely and without wavering. And the temptations he faces are tough, just like we face tough temptations in life. But we must resist. We must continue to follow God. But obedience doesn't come naturally, does it? How many of you just automatically, you were born obeying? Not a one of you. You ever seen little babies? Do, obey, do babies obey their parents? No. One of the first words a baby learns is no. Right? No. And even if they can't say it yet, you see it. You know, you put the peas in front of the job. Open your mouth, you can see the hair thing. Right? Shoving things around. No, 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 no. Because the baby doesn't have to be taught this. It's normal. We are disobedient. We want to do things our own way. But you know, parents don't give up, do they? Because they know the little baby needs the bees. And when it comes to potty training time, the parents know, you know, life's going to be better for you if you don't go around wearing your diaper for the rest of your life. Right? But children resist potty training. I can tell you stories. I won't embarrass my children. But I, I can tell you stories and parents in here, you can tell stories about potty training. It is, it is tough. Because kids don't necessarily want that. But the parent knows that's what's best for them. Human parents don't always know what's best. But our Heavenly Father our Heavenly Father always knows what's best for you. 
even if you find it uncomfortable. Even if you find it, I don't want to do that. No. Your Heavenly Father always knows it's best for you. God knows what's best. And what we owe Him in our lives is our unwavering. You know, we have a lot of questions about life. If you go to the internet, I, I, even today, I was on the internet and I was asking questions. Sometimes we think the internet is our source of all answers, don't we? Any kind of question we have, we type on the internet. And when you do that, what you discover is you have all of these opinions. Sometimes, sometimes fairly good opinions, sometimes facts, etc. But everybody weighs in on the question. There's all these forums and these chats and everybody coming in with different... Some of those answers are apparently wrong. Some of them may be wrong. But everyone seems to have an opinion out there. Lots of answers. Oftentimes conflicting. But the thing is that God's answers are always correct. You have a question about life, God's answer to it is always correct. I don't care what it is. The Bible doesn't talk about computers. But the principles behind when and when not to use it are still there. Everything in life, God has an answer to on how we should live, how we should act, how we should approach things. Because God has a perfect plan for living for you and me. Perfect plan. He knows exactly what we need. But the thing is, is we have to learn to listen and obey. We have to learn to listen to God and obey what He said. Psalm 119 is filled with the cries of a man who is desperate to follow God. Who understands the need for an unwavering obedience. Let's look at a passage, Psalms 119 is huge. Just look at just a few verses. Psalms 119, 57 through 62. It starts out, it says, You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways, and I have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your words. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I not forget your law. This psalm reveals some really deep issues. Some really hard issues in here that I want us to look at really briefly before we go to our focal passage. And the first one is we see in here it talks about my portion. He says, you are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. And for us, Nowadays we go portion. What are we talking about here? But for the Israelite, portion was a big deal because the Israelites going into the Promised Land, they were the tribes were allotted a portion of land. This was yours, and then the tribes broke it down even further that this was yours. This this little plot of land, this was yours, and that's where the the Israelite would make their living. That's where they would be able to raise their family, be able to pasture their sheep, etc. This was important. This was their inheritance. It was the big thing in their lives, the portion. But the psalmist is saying this, wait a minute, you are my portion. Not this land. Not this other thing that would be my, my living. You, Lord. You're the, the emotion of it. You're all to me. You're everything to me. You're everything I need. Is that your heart? When you think of God, can you look at God and say, You are everything. You sustain me. More than my my boyfriend, more than my girlfriend, more than my wife, my husband, my children, my job, my home, my country. You, Lord, are the crucial element. 
your mind first. Ultimately, you're all I need. Do you feel that way? That's this psalmist's heart. Then he says, I sought your face with my whole heart. And I have to ask, do we? Do we really seek God with our whole heart? Or is he, is he somebody we just pay lip service to? Is he somebody we talk about on a Sunday and the rest of the week we don't think about God? Who is God to you? Are you constantly seeking his face? goes on, he says, my promise, he says, I have promised to obey your words and then later be gracious to me according to your promise. My promise, your promise. This is the covenant relationship. I promise to obey, you promise to bless. That relationship involves trust. Do we trust him? Do we trust Him to take care of us? Do we trust Him to guide us? Do we trust God in every aspect of our lives? Fourth thing that we can see in this, he says, he's talking about considered my ways. He says, I have considered my ways. I've looked at the ways that I do things. And after considering them, I have turned my steps to your statutes. In other words, I've done some self-examination here. I've looked at my life, and I see if I'm going my own way, it's not going right. But I understand that if I turn to you, my path will be straight. Can we say that? Have you done that self-examination? Have you looked in your life and have said to yourself, see, that doing it my own way, doing it my friend's ways, Doing it the way the world says, it's just not getting me anymore. I need to do it, God. Are you taking the time to do that? And look at your life. Did you truly consider your words? And then turn it on. He says, I will hasten and not delay to obey you. You know, we, we hear sometimes what God wants us to do, and then we procrastinate. We go, ah, you know, I, I don't think I'm ready, Lord. I, you know, you want me to step out. You want me to lead. You want me to witness. You want me, I don't know that I'm ready, Lord. Do you know what procrastination leads to? Rebellion. The longer we procrastinate, the more likely it is that we will not obey. So the psalmist says, no, no, no. I am going to hasten and not delay the following commandments. And then he says, though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. You know, the thing is, is that the wicked, the world, whoever, even ourselves, will bind ourselves, will keep ourselves somehow from obeying. Yet the psalmist is saying, no, no, no matter what happens, I am going to break through. I am going to obey you. Do you have that drive? In your own life, do you have that drive, that ambition to say, you know, I don't care. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what kind of pressure is put on me. I will obey God. I will move forward. Because, Lord, you're my portion. You're all I need. And I will hasten to obey you. That should be our heart cry. Christ paid it all for us. The reason we have hope for the future is because God loved us so much He sent His Son to die for us. We owe Him not a little bit, not 33%, not 25%, not 75%. We owe, owe him it all. Are we willing to give it all? Unwavering obedience. 
Paul understands this need. He agrees with the psalmist. He understands this need to obey God completely as well. So he's willing to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit in his life, no matter what the cost is. Look at Acts 20, 23. We've read this before, but going back to kind of set the stage, he says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. He's heading to Jerusalem. You remember we've talked about that. He's heading to Jerusalem and he knows this. He says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me. Prisons and hardships are facing me, but guess what? I'm still obeying. I'm still going. Even though the Holy Spirit, the Spirit tells me this is going to happen, I'm still going because he's also compelling me. So what, when we look at that, when we look at that, and we see that he's compelled to go, and we see that right before the, our focal passage, we see in Acts how as he's traveling, people are talking to him, others are prophesying, and, and there's this, this whole drama about him getting to Jerusalem. As he gets closer, we're going to see today how Paul is about to face one of the greatest challenges to his desire to obey that he's encountered yet. And that's in Acts 21, 10 and 14. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Jews. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So what can we learn from Paul's experience? First of all, we can learn that obeying God won't always be pleasant. <clears throat> obeying God will not always be pleasant. I don't know where that attitude is. You know, hey, I'm a Christian now. I'm going to follow God. Everything's going to go great for me. Guess what? No. It's not the way it works. God doesn't promise you a rose garden. God doesn't say, hey, you obey me. Everything's going to go smooth. This ice cream and flowers from now on. Sorry, that's not the way it works. All you have to do is look through the Bible and look at those who follow. The end is one. We achieve in the end being with Jesus forever. That's worth it. But the process? It's going to be tough, baby. It's going to be tough. Elijah was probably one of the most powerful prophets out there. I mean, you saw things happen for Elijah. It was amazing. Right? But he gets to a point when Jezebel basically calls out the death squads for him, and he's running for his life, and he flees finally to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, and he gets up there, and listen to his words, this great man of God. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left now they're trying to kill me too. And Elijah's like, man, it's just me now. And, and they're trying to kill me. And he's crying out to God. God sustains him. God gets him through. But obedience is tough. Obedience is hard. It's not pleasant oftentimes. 
And probably no one in history has known this more than Jesus. I mean, think about it. We're not just talking to temptations. He's heading toward Jerusalem during that final time, right? Right before the crucifixion. He's heading toward Jerusalem and he knows it's a trap. He knows what's going to happen just like Paul going to Jerusalem. He knows it's a trap. He still goes. Look at Luke 13, 31 to 33. At that time, some Pharisees, you remember the Pharisees? He's always fighting with these guys. The Pharisees come to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. <coughs> he replied, go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I'll reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. This is, this is not, I'm going to get out of this. He's going to his death. And he knows it. Yet Jesus, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, where it says he's sweating so much it's like drops of blood coming out. Even though he's asking this cup, this death, if, if for some way it can be taken from me, please. But if not, thy will be done. Even at that moment, Jesus is saying, I will obey. I know my death is going to be horrific. I know physically I am going to go through agony. But your will be done. I will obey. Unwavering. One of the things I want you to hear that's really important. If you hang on to almost anything in this sermon, I want you to hear this. As his children, we know that God wants what is best for us. Says that. But listen, what is best for us, or what seems best for us physically, is not always. What is best for us spiritually? I'll repeat that. What seems to be best for us physically is not always what is best for us spiritually. You might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Death? Death is a very physical thing. I don't see how this is the best thing for me. Being tortured, going through this, how is this the best thing for me? It wouldn't be if your life ended at this earthly death. But our earthly existence in this flesh is only a brief time. In light of eternity, this is a blink. This is a blip. Our spirit goes on. And so what happens to us physically really doesn't matter. It's the spiritual matters. And God knows this. And God knows that what is happening to us physically, even if it means death, physical death, is what's best for us in a spiritual sense, in a long-term sense. If we're obeying God, I, mean, I don't pretend that there will be times where disobeying God, we get killed. That was not what was best for us. But if we're obeying God, it doesn't matter what we're facing, what kind of physical trauma we're facing. It was best. It will be best for us. Can you imagine if Jesus had refused the cross? We'd all be toast, by the way. But it would have been best for him spiritually. His obedience to God was what was important. His obedience to his Father. Most of us, our obedience to God is unlikely to cause most of us to die physically. But it will mean dying to ourselves. Dying to ourselves. 
die into our wants, die into our desires, die into our fleshly motivations. But that's what we're calling it. The question is how many of us are willing to sacrifice our will for His on a daily basis? And it is daily, isn't it? It's moment by moment. Moment by moment we struggle to obey Him. What to do, what to say, what to watch, what to, what to, what to look at on our phones, or look at on the internet, etc. We're always going to struggle with Him. He doesn't promise that we will never struggle. He promises to be with us during the struggle. The world may oppose us. We may rebel. But the thing we need to keep in mind is the greatest opposition to us may also come from our loneliness. The greatest opposition to us following God's will may come from those closest to us. Paul had made many enemies on his missionary journeys, but he also made many close friends. And as we see in this passage, as he's following the Spirit's leading toward Jerusalem, He's, he's encountering some well-intentioned opposition. In Acts 21.4, look at this. It says, We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Don't continue on. Don't continue on. Now, wait a minute. Is this a mixed message? The Spirit's compelling, but these guys are saying they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. That makes sense. Paul still has to go. But what they're seeing is the hardships. What they're seeing is what Paul's going to suffer. And they're saying, oh, don't go, you're going to suffer. The thing is, Paul knows this. He knows he's going to suffer, but he knows he has. Well intentioned friends and family may try to keep us from the right path. Out of fear for our safety. We talk a lot about the sacrifice that a missionary couple might make, let's say, to go to the mission field, especially if it's a really restricted country. It's a place where there's a lot going on against Christians. And we think, well, how brave they are. They're going there, they're, you know, etc. Do you ever think about the parents? The family members sending these people off. A parent looking at their child being called in some really restrictive access country. You can't fearing for the sake. Sometimes they even go so far as to try to convince the child not to go. No, surely God's not telling you to do this. And sometimes it may be motivated by the fact they just don't want to lose their child. Not only to death, but maybe for a long period of time because, hey, they may never see their children they may never see their grandchildren. There's that sense of loss. And so we are tugged sometimes because we love people. We, we love our family. We love our friends. And we don't want to hurt them. But God's still calling us to that. Ultimately, we must obey and pray. They eventually understand. Paul's friends let go with tears, not fully understanding. Those we love may not always understand the call on our lives either, the need to obey God completely and always. When Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, they didn't really get it. They didn't understand. John 13, 6 through 8, we see Peter's reaction. He gave a sign to Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of it. Jesus was saying, you don't get this. You don't get what I'm doing. Someday you will understand. Someday you will understand. We may not get the people around us may not understand what we're doing. We have to pray they will eventually understand. 
But what we need to realize is that we have to, even when we don't see the big picture, we have to obey. And we have to obey without wavering. So our question today is how obedient are we to the Spirit's leading? How obedient are we to the Spirit's leading? We're called to unwavering obedience daily, every moment. But do it. God knows what's best, even if we don't always see it. But will we trust Him enough to obey Him completely? Will we learn to live a life of unwavering? Father God, thank you for uh, your incredible love for us. And your desire, Lord, for us to have the best. But that best will not always be pleasant. Thank you, Lord, for calling us and guiding us to obey you, to follow the way you would have us go. Lord, help us to have the courage to do that. To always obey you. Trust you. In Christ's name.